I was here at this prestigious university some eight years ago, and I was actually here for a month, and I gave a series of lectures, and I went back and looked at those lectures, and I thought, it's all different. I've got the same lecture materials, but the whole situation has changed in just the space of eight years. And what I'm going to do today is to say why I think it's changed. I don't think we, we are not in a society where everyone can translate yet, but we may be there very soon. Okay? And why is that? Yes, quite right. It's because we have excellent functional machine translation. Uh, forgive machine translation since 2016 has entered a new era uh, of performance and quality which really does give accessibility not to everyone but to everyone who can use a computer intelligently okay which is sort of everyone below the age of 30 these days and the younger you are the better it is the better you can do it let's see what happens when everyone can translate we could all be out of a job Hey, if everybody can do what we're doing, what are we here for? Help. Right? And I want to start from that initial premise. Something profound is changing out there, and we should know what it is, and know how we as, I don't know, professionals of the translation interpreting rock of things to do, activities, how we can position ourselves with respect to historical change. I hope this is not new to you, but it's of some interest that machine translation began after the Second World War as an extension of code breaking. If you watch the film The Enigma Code, I think, you'll find that they figured out that uh, we can crack the code for Nazi messages, so let's work on Russian, we look from English to Russian to get rocket technology in that age, and on Chinese. Everybody wanted rocket technology after the end of the Second World War. And I think it's Shannon who said, we, we look at a text that's written in Russian and we imagine it's, it's encoded. All we have to do is crack the code. And the first work there, uh, around IBM, the early days, they thought they would have it done in about five to seven years. They would have cracked the code and we will have automatic machine translation for for rocket technology at least, okay? And what happened there, we went along, you get a famous report there, the ALPAC report, which came out and said, you know what? It's so hard to understand these machine translated texts that it's going to be easier to get our scientists to learn Russian. Easier and quicker. Didn't say it's impossible to get machine translation. They just said, look, it's more cost-effective to learn a language than to try to correct all the mistakes the machines make. And that banged machine translation research on the head and put it to bed, and it, it didn't really appear again until the 1990s. Okay? Uh, some places, Meteo is the uh, weather report in Canada. Canada has just two la official languages, French and English, Cognate languages, very easy to work between. And the weather, hey, there's only a certain number of things that can happen in the weather. Right, rain, cloudy, temperature. And, and so highly codified field with just a few terms. And the weather report has been machine translated in Canada from the early 1980s. It works, has always worked for a long time in any field with a restricted number of variations. But then it went away. In the 1990s, those of you who are translators, you'll know that actually what we started to use were translation memories, which were just macros put onto a word program, nothing, nothing special. And translation memories would enable us to keep our previous translations and bring them up whenever the same or a very similar sentence emerged, we would bring up our own translation. Okay, so I hope all of you who are translators or learning to be translators are aware of 
of translation memory technology, which is really very, very simple. And nothing like uh, machine translation. Those are called CAT tools. Just bear with me. CAT. You know C-A-T? CAT tools? Stands for Computer Aided Translation or Computer Assisted. What a lousy term, ladies and gentlemen. Everything I do in my life is a computer assisted. You know, like telling the time, or writing an email, or watching a phone. Everything is computer. It makes no sense to say computer assisted translation. As soon as you write in a Word document, it's computer assisted. Okay. So I, when I talk about translation technologies, do you know the technical term I use? It's translation technologies. That's what they are. Okay. Of which the main ones these days are translation memories, which we had in the 1990s, TRADOS and so on, and machine translation, which have been joined together. <coughs> TMMT, that's what I teach, TMMT. Translation memories with machine translation. Yeah. Translation technologies, simple way. In the 90s, machine translation came back. Why did it come back? Well, up to then, people had been writing algorithms, rules, in order to get between French and English, which is pretty easy. And to get between Chinese and English, they would have to write a lot of rules uh, to, 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 to transform things and pick up things, to put them in the right order. And it was laborious. In the 1990s, though, linguists were moved to the side a little, don't tell anybody, we do like linguists, but mathematicians came in and said, look, you know all these rules, that's good, keep them, we're not going to throw away the rules, they're fine, but when the rules give up, let's just look at this database of bytexts. You know what a bytext is? A little bit of English and a little bit of Chinese, and they go together, it's a bytext, and we think that's a good translation. Okay, get those bytexts, put them in to a database, and then when you have to translate this little bit of Chinese into English, look for it in the database and bring up the various translations it had before, and then mathematically calculate the probability that the same association is working this time. How? Well, you get the, the characters that are there, and the characters following, and the characters preceding, calculate the probability, then the probability for the next set, then the probability. Massive calculation, but done almost instantaneously, and the results were suddenly much, much better. This was statistical machine translation or example-based machine translation. Okay? Taking over from the linguistic-based transfer uh, machine translation, which was uh, conceived of as a problem of algorithms, of writing rules. In the 1990s, uh, that grew, and IBM, big computer company, started by buying up corporate, buying up huge bodies of bytexts. For example, the parliamentary proceedings of Canada are all in French and English. Huge buy text. Buy all that. Put it into the machine. Okay. Buy up anything that is in electronic form and is arranged uh, in, in terms of, of, of established equivalents. In Europe, the entire acquis communautaire, that's the body of laws that govern the European Union, all arranged in terms of buy text, put it into the database. And the promise of SMT, statistical machine translation, was that the bigger the database, the better the mathematics will give you the probability, the better the result you get. So the game was on in the 1990s to get big, big databases of bytexts. What happened then? Well, it's strange. Two things happened. After a while, people realized that the data sets were getting bigger, but the quality was not improving very much. It wasn't going down, but it would just stay 
I don't know. How come? It doesn't work. And then uh, a company called Google, that you don't know anything about in China, <laughs> do you? Uh, brought out, I think in 2009, they brought out um, a Google Translator Toolkit. They brought out free translation memory technology that you could use online with machine translation coming into it. And this was free. And when we saw this, I remember being in the, a, a conference of translators when it just came out. We were looking at this thing. What? It's a translation memory? Yes, it works. I can bring up my previous translations. And I get the machine translation coming in. Wow, and it works. And I can talk with my colleagues with a chat function. And we can see each other's translations in real time. I thought, this is the end. 2009, huh? This is the end. Why? Because we thought, everybody will use this free tool. They'll get the, the, the imperfect translation from machine translation. They'll correct it in this tool. Okay? That's post-editing. Correcting machine translation is post-editing. They'll post-edit it. And then the good translations will go back into the database. The database will get better. The better the database, the better the, the output. The better the output, the more people use it. The more people use it, the more database. The more database, the more people use it. The better. Can you see this, this logic? It just seems a, a, a virtuous circle. Okay? That the more you use it, the better it gets. The better it is, the more you... It goes up to heaven. Like the, the Tower of Babel in the Christian Bible in the Old Testament, uh, solving the problems of language. I thought personally that was it. I thought that was the end for us professional translators. And it didn't happen. Do you know why it didn't happen? The Tower of Babel did not reach up to paradise. And everybody being able to translate. What went wrong? Is it that the machines couldn't do it after all? No way. Machines are quite happy. They do what you tell them to do. Problem is, people are stupid. <laughs> Happily. Happily for us. Because you had these machine translations become publicly available. Then stupid people think they're good translations because they don't know the other language or they don't know this language that you're translating into. They pick it up, they put it on the website. The Google crawler comes across and says, hey, I found a translation. Picks it up, puts it in the database. <laughs> database has more errors in it, the quality and So this, this virtuous circle that went up to heaven becomes a vicious circle of rubbish in, rubbish out, rubbish in, rubbish out, <laughs> and it goes down the toilet, basically. <laughs> All right? So, uh, I, I won't say there's, there's no actual evidence of, of whole languages becoming worse in machine translation, but there is evidence of many languages not advancing. Uh, not because the machines were inadequate, or the algorithms were bad, or the statistics were wrong. Basically because people thought the translations were good translations. Lack of education about what machine translation is, and how to use it, really stymied the project for some years there. To the extent that Google stopped giving free machine translation services, into many of the uh, translation memory products. Okay, we used to have a translation memory. We got Trados or, or uh, MemoQ or Omega T or WordFast. Any of these classic uh, translation memory products, you would always have a machine translation feed coming into it. Then Google said, "Uh, uh, you guys are stupid. We know it." And they took it away and said, "You have to pay for it." If you have to pay for it, you might have to think. You might be intelligent. You might know what you're doing. All right? Now, that's changed. That's changed. Uh, we've moved into a new stage here of neural machine translation in 2016. Now, neural machine translation is just more complicated mathematics. Okay? It pushes 
the testing and retesting of probabilistic calculations to the extent that what counts is not how many instances you have, but how often they occur together. A neural thereby enables a statistical representation of what we call context. So we could gather quite quickly the normal usage of this kind of language, what kind of text it is in, and these are the kinds of solutions you would give for that kind of text. If you know translation theory, it would be applying what Katharina Reis had said right back in 1978, how you translate depends on the text type. Hey, the machine knows this now and can use it quite happily. And so for many languages that have adequate databases, that is language resources, neural machine translation since 2016 has improved things tremendously. And uh, there's no evidence of that vicious circle. The vicious circle is not there anymore. It doesn't quite, it, I don't know if you, Baidu has it. So if you're using machine translation, you're using neural these days. Uh, you could use Baidu, Yandex for Russian, uh, Microsoft Translator, and, and Google, by the way, but you don't know about Google, but Microsoft, you can use them, Baidu. Uh, you're using Neural, and you should have noticed that the quality is much better. It's tricky, though. I don't know, just play with it, learn about it, please. You learn about it by playing with it. It does cunning things, like if if a solution it suggests is very, very low frequency and seems not to fit in with the context and it only appears once, do you know what happens? It disappears. It's using omission strategically, the way conference interpreters have always been doing. <laughs> <laughs> and some translators, but we won't tell anybody out of the profession that we actually omit things. The machine translation has got very, very sophisticated in those respects. When it's likely to be wrong, it, it sweeps it under the carpet. No, we don't, we're not going to give you that. Okay, so that's where we are. Lots of remaining problems. We are by no means at the stage of perfection. We haven't solved that problem of getting a, a, a virtuous circle back in motion. We've just got pretty good quality output. I'm going to give you an example um, in a minute. Obviously, they're being used. You can complain all you want about machine translation, but it is being used. That's 2016. It's going to be even more now in 2019. Okay? Uh, oh, this is not good. It's messed it up. Who knows German? X. Excellent. So you be quiet. <laughs> okay. For the rest of you, you don't know German, you've got no idea what their text is saying, okay? So what do you do? You put it through machine translation. Now, if you had done that, let's say, 12 to 13 years ago, you would have got something like, no, oh, no, come back. It's all been messed up, of course. Right, that's much, oh, no, one, I've got a cheap print, gentle one. Gentle one. Yes. Okay, well, this might work. Uh, the machine translation from the old machine translation, this is a, a transfer, the, the kind of transfer one I was talking about, pre statistical. They're writing rules. And bear in mind, German and English are very close. So if I get this text, it is, of course, in the future to talk to that be translated simultaneously from your mobile phone? Do you understand that? If you do, you're, you're doing very well. <laughs> and to what extent will facilitate the language cultural communication in the Switzerland or difficult? <laughs> it, look, it was at the level of surrealist poetry. <laughs> you, you could enjoy it, but, but for other things. Not, not for its information content. All right. Now, the, the link to neural is here. This is what neural gives you. It is, of course, in the future. No, it isn't. We just had that. No! Well. Can 
Hangi mühürün alman? Anlatması feci. This mühürün alman? No, one four. Yes, one four. One four. Yes, this is bad. This was sister. One four again. It still doesn't work, I put the wrong one in. Okay, take it from me that the neural will bring out that um, in the future is it self-evident that we, 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 we will be able to translate simultaneously from our mobile phones. Okay, it just gives it perfectly. Uh, take it from me, sorry. And the problem is, is a simple, well not simple, but this this word here, selbstverständlich, in German, was, was bedeutet das denn? Like, of course. Of course, yes. yes. So they've translated it, of course. But it doesn't make sense there. Okay? Because this thing can be, um, ça va de soi, selbstverständlich, of course, naturally, for example. Alright? It's, or it's evident that. Or something like this. And it could be an adjective or an adverbial. Of course, is an adverbial, but not here, all right? Uh, so it couldn't pick it up, it couldn't pass it, it couldn't say what part of speech it was, it couldn't fit it into the sentence. The neural can. And how does it do it? It does it by going the right way. There we go. Selbstverständlich is normally of course. Okay, but that doesn't work here. But we've got alternatives, and this is this is actually from Google Translate. Okay, and you pick up one that will work. Like I can't even read it. That's not good. Yes, self-evident. Is it obvious that we will all use machine translation? Is it self-evident? An adjective, any adjective will do, and you've got it cracked. Neural can do that. Uh, Transfer could not do that. And that's the kind of advance that we've made. An advance that I really like a lot is not to go backwards. Uh, this system, which doesn't work for Chinese, I'm sorry. It's a German system, Depot. It's really fun to work with. Why? Because this is the same sentence, okay? If you don't like the translation it gives, you click on the word that doesn't seem to fit, and you automatically get all the alternative words that could go there. Scroll down, select the one you like, and the rest of the translation adjusts automatically. Okay, and I think this is this is where we're heading now with neural and what's called interactive machine translation. Another one is um, where you're as you're typing your translation, the machine picks up what you're going to say, so you start typing a word and the machine translation will give you the rest of that sentence. So you're, you're typing, indicating your preferences as a translator, but the machine will read your preferences and predict where you're going to go. If it gets it wrong, gets it wrong, type again. Type in other letters and it will know what you're trying to say. Okay, so the, the advances are in the quality of the statistics, but also in the interactivity of the systems that we're using, where people who can translate can use this tool to translate better and faster, with fewer typing problems and fewer wrist problems and neck problems. You know, ergonomically, it makes sense. You're typing less, so your body enjoys it much more. Are there any questions about that? Is that clear to everybody? Okay, I'm just worried about all these people standing up. Okay. Let's go on. You know this... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Doesn't work, does it? Right. 
we are not in paradise. No. Uh, I remember Obama being elected in 2008. I was actually living in California at the time. And when he came in to be president of the United States, he had a list of things we can do. A long list. He didn't achieve many things on it. <laughs> healthcare. He got a bit of healthcare. That was all. Uh, one of the things on his to-do list was this. Automatic, highly accurate, real-time translation between the great major languages of the world, lowering barriers to international commerce and collaboration. If we can solve that problem so everybody can translate, then we will get more understanding, more trade, we'll be richer and happier, and live in peace forever. <laughs> Didn't happen. Technically, neural does seem to promise that. But just look at this. Who knows Spanish? Somebody up the back there. Yeah. My, my son knows Spanish. <laughs> You remember, you weren't in there, but you might have heard, Obama's slogan was, yes we can, right? Yes we can what? We don't know what, but we can, whatever it is. Okay? Yes we can. Into Spanish, this is, si podemos, which is important because podemos is the name of a political party in Spain, which had this inspiration, okay? Is that correct, si podemos? Yes, says my son. That's a correct translation. Very good. <laughs> so what you do to play with machine translation systems, you get the translation, and then you translate it. So, si podemos becomes, si podemos becomes, if we can. Hmm, yes we can, if we can. <laughs> this is Google. This is why good China does not need Google at all. Because this mistake has been in Google for at least 10 years and nobody's corrected it. Okay, there are errors in the system. Here the error is quite simple. It forgot a little accent on the C, on the I. Okay, but the accent can change the whole deal, right? So, we do live in a world of imperfection and traps, even the most obvious traps. Um, Microsoft and Baidu and Yandex don't make this mistake. Only Google makes this particular mistake, but they all make mistakes, okay? Uh, that's the important thing to realize there. Now, what I want to do in, for the next few minutes is consider these advances and just attack some of the attack question some of the myths that circulate, some of the things that people say about machine translation, some of which are true, some of which are half true, and a lot of which are just lies. Here we go. Humans will always translate better than a machine. Who believes that? Come on. <laughs> Lots of people do. Yeah. I got this in a seminar. I was giving a talk like this, and, and after about an hour, one of the guys this is rubbish. No machine can translate as well as I do. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah, okay, I know there are mistakes, sure. Do you ever make mistakes? <laughs> Humans are fallible too, eh? Even me, sometimes, okay. Right, let's consider this statement. Humans will always translate better than a machine. My problem is this. The machine doesn't translate. The machine doesn't translate. And this is the big, the big thing that happened. Back when people were writing algorithms, rules, those rules were translating. They were generating a translation. As soon as it moved into statistics, what the machine does is locate a previous human translation. You need a database the database is produced by humans. So, hey, it's not the machine, it's the stupid person back there. No. All the machine does is try to find the right person who did the translation. That's like a dating agent's database. <laughs> okay. So if the machine doesn't translate, the machine picks up prior human translations. Okay. 
if you're into Marxist theory, I don't know if that works in China anymore. But it means that what you have in the database is the equivalent of capital, of linguistic capital, dead human labor, the repository of the labor of previous translators, all in that database. And it's good to look at it that way. Somebody created it, somebody invested their labor in it, and that labor is being reused by the capitalists of the information economy, which happen to be big machine translation companies. Second myth. So that's, that's my response to the myth. I, I, I'm not into judging who does better. Some humans are great translators. A lot of humans are not great translators. So who can say? The bigger the, the, the database, the better the MT. Who believes that? I don't know. I was at the uh, Congress of the uh, International Translators Federation in 2017. And there was a big plenary presentation on machine translation and big data. Because big data is fashionable, right? There's lots of big data for everything. And if we get big data, we can crunch the numbers and solve the problem. Well, yes and no. This was thought to be true in the 1990s, in the age of statistical machine translation. These days, it is not held to be true as much. So anybody who goes around talking about big data as a solution is being idealistic. These days, because neural works on context and not huge um, absolute probabilities, what you need is clean data. You need bytexts that are good translations and that will conform a context with some degree of certitude. So you need a clean database, not a big database. And this is why MT companies in uh, China are employing graduate translators to go and post edit, just clean up the database, correct all of our translations to get a clean database. The cleaner it is, the better it is. Now this is uh, interesting, just as a proposition, that uh, quality has become more important than quantity in machine translation. This means two things. IBM, this big, nasty, capitalist computer company that started everything back after the Second World War, IBM has, for each of its products, which is basically software, okay, but also computers, um, business software, a machine translation system. One system per product. Okay, not, not a huge one for everything, no. One per product. Why would they do that? Because everything in that product is very specific and there's only a certain number of things that can happen in it. Right? It's like the weather in Canada. Yeah. Only certain things can happen in the weather. Or uh, another famous example is uh, Caterpillar. Caterpillar produces big, heavy machinery, like bulldozers and graders and all this stuff on construction sites. All right? Big machine, lots of parts. Parts have numbers. Parts fit together. Parts break down. How many verbs are there that can happen? Uh, so uh, Caterpillar for each machine, or IBM for each program, has one machine translation system. Incredibly clean. In fact, for Caterpillar, it's so clean that they can write their texts in what's called Caterpillar English. Basic English. Don't use any passive verbs. Don't use any subordination. Don't use reflexes. Don't use any proforms at all. Uh, you just write basic English. Okay? And if the lexicon is very clean and exact, they can use machine translation into any number of languages with only minimal post-editing afterwards. IBM, same story. But because if it's clean... So what's happening here is that machine translation 
it started to move away from the big, big public database that we know and use for free and into small in-house machine translation systems which are in effect no different from big translation memory systems. Okay? Translation memory stores your previous translations. Now the memories have got bigger, we're using some statistical stuff to find the good translations and to make changes that we had to make by hand. But the technology of MT has joined the technology of TM. And we get TMMT together. Machine translation systems can be set up for free if you know how to do it. Moses is the most popular uh, system available now. If you've got a product you want to sell and you want to sell in 10 or 20 languages, set up your own in-house machine translation system. It's not rocket science. What's interesting in this shift of paradigm from quantity to quality is the following. In the 1990s and even through to 2005, the big language uh, provision company, language service providers in the West, uh, this is a project uh, instigated by Taos in, uh, based in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, got together and we said we all have resources for our languages. Okay, resources are, are databases and rules, basically. And if we share our resources, we could potentially map all the languages in the world. We could really produce something that would enable us to translate between all the languages in the world. Now, wasn't that idealistic? Because it was, talk it was called the Human Language Project, which was calped on the Human Genome Project. Have you heard about the Genome Project? The human DNA, and they mapped the genes in the DNA, and it took scientists all over the world, I don't know, 10 years, of international, coordinated international activity, and they finished mapping the human DNA. The Human Genome Project did that produced something scientifically valid of benefit to all humanity by working together. Not stupid, we could do the same thing for language. It's just a matter of getting the, the resources and the database and doing the mapping, and we could produce something that would really enable everybody to understand everybody else. Didn't happen. Do you know why it didn't happen? Yes. Hey, they're companies. They have to make a profit. And as soon as the value became not the quantity but the quality, they realized that the thing they were selling was the quality of their database. And so they weren't going to share it with anybody. Because it's ours. Okay? And we'll pay uh, young translators to come and clean it up to do the post editing. And so, I'm not going to share it. This is the thing I sell. Whole project fell apart. We have no human language project. We have competing companies selling clean, cleaner databases in the world. Ah. Machine translation has reached parity with humans. This is more sophisticated than, than the student who said, no machine can translate as well as I can. Here, parity means the same. And it's a serious claim. It's 2018, hey, that's last year. I think it was July of last year. Hassan et al, a whole list of scientists at you get it right. Yeah, I, no, at Microsoft. This was a Microsoft research project on the translation of news articles between Chinese and English. Okay? And they did a test of their machine translation system. They got 18 
Million? Thousand. Million? You get back to million. A lot of... <laughs> no, they can get, yes. Bilingual sentence pairs. They got bilingual sentence pairs, right? Um, they got bilingual crowd workers. I have no idea who they are, but there are lots of them, apparently. Um, the crowd workers had to say whether or not these sentences conveyed the semantics of the source text. Right? And they found that the evaluations of the machine translation sentences and the human translation sentences were not significantly different. Therefore, the same. No, statistically that's not true, but anyway. This experiment was done in order to prove that machine translation is at the level of human translation. And I wouldn't, why not? I mean, machines can beat humans at chess. Machines can beat humans at playing Go. So why not translation? Of course they can. What's wrong with this, though? Should we accept it as being true? Well, yeah, they can't tell which one was done by machine translation. The fact that you can't tell doesn't mean that one's better than the other. It just means there's no statistical relationship. It doesn't mean there's one better than the other. Parity here means no significance. And no significance in most empirical science means no result. But my problem is really this one. The question concerned the semantics of the source text, the meaning. It didn't concern elegance or normal expression. It had no question about the form of expression. And as long as you're not asking about form, well, yeah, machine translation sort of gets, I know what they're trying to say. Uh, machine translation is good for gist translation. What is it about? But you're not going to sell a car using machine translation. Or sell anything. Or have any, any declare your love for it. No. Those things you need form. You need work on form. Okay? So the question is, is um, truncated here by focusing only on one aspect of what a text is and not on the entire functioning of the text. And the second is, hey, isolated sentences. Do we communicate in isolated Perhaps we do. <laughs> when I'm thinking of my son on his, and his, his gaming all the time, you know, shooting and stuff. And yeah, it does, perhaps, the younger generation perhaps does communicate in isolated sentences. Uh, the rest of us, though, uh, actually work on texts. Okay? And texts are strings of a certain length and thereby complexity. Now, if you've worked on machine translation, you'll know that it makes predictable mistakes. Still, not just the Podemos one of Obama, but any time you have a cohesion problem of one paragraph referring to the previous one, no way. Or even a sentence picking up on the previous sentence, very difficult. Particularly if there are genders involved of pronouns or of nouns, if your language is some European languages, like German has three genders, oh, that gets a mess. Okay, uh, we were working on Indonesian in Australia, which has a complex gender system for nouns and for pronouns. No way, couldn't do it. Uh, politeness structures with Japanese, forget about it. They can't do it. Okay, so uh, these things that require textuality, uh, machine translation tends not to be good at. Isolated sentences, yes. So what they're doing here in this experiment is stacking the deck. You know that expression? I'm going to play cards with you, but I put the aces in my part of the deck of cards. So I'm going to win. Yeah? Mm. By asking that question and doing that experiment, they were destined to find the result that they found. Now, the isolated sentences is important. And this is my main argument against machine translation. We know empirically that 
If we compare novice translators, people beginning a master program, for example, with experienced professionals, for the novice translator, everything in the text is hard. All the problems are problems to be solved. And they'll work on each problem in turn as they go through the text. On the other hand, a professional translator will tend to go fast using semi-automatic routines or automatic routines, translating uh, because they've, they have mapping operations that they have got very used to, and then, boom, problem. Oh, hard problem. Think, 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 think. This is from cognitive research. Their, their performance is much, much less even. They'll go fast, 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 problem, fast, 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 problem, okay? Whereas beginners go problem, 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 problem. <laughs> I, I simplify it. Why do they do that? Because when you get a text and you know where it's going and you know what you're getting paid for and you know what effect it has to do on the, on the, on the user of the text, you know that some parts are low risk. If you make a mistake there, no, leave, leave it out, doesn't matter. But if you make a mistake there, whoa, the whole thing's going to go to fail. So I'm going to work hard on that high risk problem and not hard on the low risk problem. Right? Logical, just makes sense. And professionals do that, and we see that in their cognitive performances. We do work with the eye tracking especially these days, and we can see that happening there. Now, a machine cannot judge risk. It can't see the communicative act, therefore cannot distribute the risk, therefore cannot distribute the effort. If in a page of text, this is a machine translation one, this is a human translation one, this has three mistakes in it, this has three mistakes in it, are they the same? If this is a professional translator, they're not the same. Because the three mistakes here will not be in the high risk area. The three mistakes here could be in any. Okay? And this is it's hard to explain, I know, it's difficult, but, but this is very, very important for the human logic of communication and why human translators are not going to do exactly what the machine does. The machine uses the machine, neural machine translation uses strategic omission. So do we. But we don't do that in the high risk bits. They can't tell. Okay? Now that's getting into an important logic based on this paper, uh, which is an interesting piece of research. And it's a provocation. We have to really think what are they doing? Why did they find that? Why am I not happy with their finding? How can we react? Am I going for time? I, I, I've got... Sorry? Sorry? Oh, half. oh, that's too much time. Okay, we'll go. I won't go into philosophy then. Uh, the, um, the Hassan paper uh, borrows much from singularity theory, uh, which comes from a guy called Ray Kurzweil, uh, who was a great inventor, a very creative thinker, and he uh, demonstrates that human intellect increases over time. Let's hope. Okay, we get smarter, we learn more things, let's hope. I'm not too sure, but there it goes. The red line is the human intellect rising. Computer processing capacity increases exponentially. Not geometrically, like that, but exponentially, like that. And the basic rule used to be that human, that the machine processing capacity doubles each 18 months. Okay, so two, four, uh, eight, and I don't know, doubles, yeah, 18 months, okay. So, uh, it stands to reason that there will be a point at which the processing capacity of the machine will meet and surpass the processing capacity of the human brain. So, statistical certitude. 
in fact. And where is that point? Hmm. It used to be 2017, but, but the, the papers sort of move it off to 2025, 2030. We're supposed to be at that point now, but, but every time I read about it, it's further off. <laughs> okay. uh, and this is supposed to have a, a transformative influence on what we as humans are. They say we will we'll become transhumans or human thinking will always be with computer processing capacity. We will become something else, like Robocop, cyborg, half human, half machine. <laughs> and yeah, sure, that we are doing that. The problem here though, what's my problem here? Any idea? People are stupid, remember that? <laughs> The processing capacity of the machine is fine. You know, computer, they, they process things quicker. Yes, they do. But if it's rubbish in, rubbish out, it doesn't matter how fast you're processing this stuff. Okay? Uh, so, uh, the logic uh, that I was mentioning before, uh, of quality, quality not quantity, the processing capacity is quantity. What counts these days is quality. So, uh, there is no necessary read-off for us in languages and machine translation from the theory of singularity, which has its word to say, and uh, what's actually happening in machine translation because of that move from quantity to quality. Okay? I can discuss, I'm happy to discuss that later on if you would like. Myth four, machine translation will never work. Now, this is still heard by many people who are very good translators. I've got, I, I don't know why I've still got it in French, but it's in French, I'm sorry about this. This is from the Quebec uh, Society, no, Order of Translators, Interpreters, and Terminologists, in fact. Yeah? And, um, oh, As most of the machine translation designers themselves recognize, we are still a long way from the day when these machines will be able to produce a translation of a quality comparable to those produced by human beings. A sight translator. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. I mean, everybody says we're not there in paradise, in reality. except for the 2008 thing I just did. 18. Yeah. Within the framework of its mandate to protect the public, to protect the public, okay, this is the order of translators in Quebec, they will protect you. Luatak, that's the order of translators and everything else, <coughs> recommends that you use the utmost care and we invite you to go to a certified translator for all your translation needs. <sighs> okay, uh, so there's a, a transition here, this is why I've got the text as it is. The transition is from, machines are not perfect, so, don't use them. Come to us for all your translation needs. Okay, and that's, that's the discursive trick that's being used and I don't think it's valid anymore. Okay, it's still out there, it's still in some very conservative organizations which are there to protect the public. The public does not need our protection. They're young, they use machines better than we do. They know what to do with them. Okay, uh, well, there are, there are parts of the public that do need some education, but still. Uh, we cannot go from that assumption of in, in, imperfect machines to the final one, which says, and that's what worries me, all your translation needs. All your translation needs. No. There are many, many needs out there that you don't need a professional translator for. And this is where I move to my social aspect. I 
Then, uh, a variant on that, machine translation is the end of the translation profession. And I, I, I wrote this in 2013, in the age of statistical machine translation, it is destined to turn most translators into post-editors. One day, perhaps soon. I didn't put a date on it, okay? Now, I've been criticized quite severely for saying that, which is like a prediction, but if you don't say when, hey, you know, it's like, we'll all die. <laughs> yeah, all right, yeah. if I don't say when, I say so what? Yeah. Uh, perhaps, perhaps not. Okay, and it does say most. It does say most. Does this mean the end of our profession? If instead of translating, we do post-editing. Post-editing is correcting machine translation. I've had students say that. Now, I was in Monterey once and I said, right, please post-edit this. And one student said, I'm sorry, I paid lots of money to come here to learn to be a translator. I don't want to post-edit, I want to translate. So I said, fine, you translate. <laughs> Half an hour later, she finished the translation. Everybody else had finished in 10 minutes. <laughs> you want to do that? You're fine. You can do it. There's no problem. Yeah. But if you can do better work faster with the aid of machine translation, why not? You're missing out. As long as you know what's, what's going on, as long as you can do it. This guy, Pim, also said... <laughs> 1998. Okay, that's going back. Translators do more than translate. So, okay, you post edit instead of translating, but you can do a lot more, and this is the trick. This is where our professionalism needn't recoil into some cave and hibernate until the rest of the world realizes what's going on. Later on in this week, I'll come back to this. This is a very simple uh, diagram of things translators can do with texts, okay? It's a simplified vine double typology, but I'm not going to explain that now. I'm just going to suggest that that things up there and things down there, there are things close to the text, loan words, borrowing, calcs, creation of new words, and things close to the text function at the bottom and the actual changing of text that machine translation will not do. Machine translation is getting very good at the stuff in the middle. But the extremes of what we can do with text, the way we can facilitate actual effective communication and change languages, is still a human preserve. It's in the middle of the machines work, not at the extremes. Uh, machines are sort of playing on two or three notes. We should have the whole orchestra at our disposal and be trained to do it. I'm not saying much new. This is Skopos theory. I'll talk about this tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'll talk about it. This is from Christiana Nort. What we've got? We've got communication. It can be cross-cultural. It can be direct or mediated. We've got translatorial action is mediated cross-cultural communication. That's what we do. Translatorial means that's what translators do, right? Now. You can be a translator and produce a translation with a source text, or you can do other stuff. Like say, your text is a lot of rubbish. Please let me correct it first. Or let me write you a new text. Or I suggest you not do this because it's not the appropriate target audience for your product. I know this market. I know the, the target culture very well. Or please let me do some terminological work. Well, let's get some terminologists in because you're, you're using different terms for different things. There's a whole lot you could do over there, which is not even producing translations. And then the translation, this is Skopos theory, can have the same function. And if you're using machine translation, at best it might. Or a new function for a new user, a new public. Machine translation can't do that. Okay? So over here, and over here, translators do more than translate. And if the machine can do that boring translation bit for us, great. So we can do the more exciting, more engaging, more entertaining activities that are out there. I'm skipping. What? Oh, that's almost. 
I, I'm finishing up now, I think, because I, I'm going. I just, I just want to mention some other research that's out there. This is by uh, somebody in Way. I haven't read the paper, 2018. I'm taking it from a lecture by Li Defeng in 2018. It was a lecture he gave in Barcelona, actually, uh, where we have an image of where we are today and where we will be in the future when we don't know. You know we will all die. <laughs> 100 years, 200 years ago. What's interesting here is that the top of the profession, which should be you guys at this institution, we're at the top. <laughs> right, and Melbourne, up there. <laughs> Number one university in Australia. Okay, right. <laughs> the pinnacle uh, stays the same. It stays the same. The, the kinds of translators who can really help companies and be trusted by companies and give advice and, and get functional texts, those kinds of translators at the top of the profession, the conference interpreters, hey, it will still be there. Okay? What changes is this ruck of professional translators who may be part-time, about 70% of the profession is part-time in the world, or who may be freelancers, about 70% are freelancers as well, okay, they will be using machine-aided translation, which means post-editing. Okay, all your translation memories, all MTM, TM, you know, translation memories and the machine translation. Why not? And these people can use it too. Why not? The trouble is, you're doing more than translate up there, okay? The rest of the world that's using machine translation uh, way says will grow a bit in the future. Now I beg to differ. I'm, I'm proposing a modification of way, which is this. Sorry, I'm not very good at drawing diagrams. <laughs> okay, this is the diagram you just saw. But I think what's happening is all these people down here are using machine translation. And they're using it for tasks that would never have gone to professional translators anyway and have no reason to go to professional translators anyway. They're using it for... Come on, work at it. Language learning. People in class are using these MT programs to learn a language, the scaffolding at the beginning. You know, you used to do mental translation in your head, didn't like that. We're using that for language learning. Tourism. Like my son today with the Chinese has got his iPad out getting a direct, or his phone, getting a translation on his phone for the Chinese menus. It works. <laughs> we had a good lunch thanks to this. Yes. GIST translation, as I said, still has its purposes and, and MT can work very well for that. Everybody with a bit of technological analysis can use it for these purposes, and it does a lot for the demo democratization of knowledge about other cultures. We, everybody can engage in knowing the other culture, linguistically, and there's no reason to stop that. There's every reason to help them do it, I suggest, by teaching machine translation in your language learning class. Teach people how to use it effectively as a, as a learning tool, rather than shunning it to the side, as has become traditional in immersive concepts of language. Um, I did have security surveillance there. Everything we do democratically, in any culture, in any country, uh, to communicate and have fun online in electronic communication, is also used to follow what we're doing. And so is machine translation. I have, I'm not talking about China, I'm talking about the United States. I've been at a presentation uh, in Monterey, which has a Defense Language Institute. We had all the satellite television in the world going speech to text with speech recognition, text foreign language into English with machine translation, search word for key keywords, automatically locate, write the word bomb or say bomb on, te on, on television. <laughs> So they've got it, okay? <laughs> Using machine translation, 
okay? And they don't need a lot of sophisticated translators for the kind of searches that they're doing. Uh, this includes everything we say on our phones, everything we write in our email. It, it's being processed in this way. Okay. I, look, I might stop there. Should I stop there? Okay, no, no, just this little bit. I'm sorry the people are standing up. Okay, I'm really, really, I do want to stop. Uh, for the past four years, I've been engaged in a research project uh, which looks at the uh, mediation strategies used by immigrant communities. So we're looking at particularly uh, asylum seekers and refugees, in this case in Ljubljana and Leipzig in Germany and in uh, Slovenia in Europe. Okay, And we find that many of these people who are quite poor, struggling from war zones, but young, use machine translation effectively, a lot. For example, if they're having an interview and they want to know what's being said to them, they will check it with their machine translation. Or classically, if they're going to a doctor, they'll, they'll use the machine translation to check the words that they have to say and to check what the doctor is saying to them, okay? And they'll use it, oh, and the laws, okay? They'll use it more than they'll use an interpreter. This is tough for people who are interpreters or community interpreters who are there to help them, okay? Why do they prefer the machine translation to the interpreter? They trust the machine? No. <laughs> they don't trust the interpreter. Okay. No, there are several factors. One is trust, and that's absolutely important. Okay. They'd rather make their own mistakes than have somebody else to make, make a mistake for them. Okay. Uh, they don't want to reveal their intimate bodily functions to another person, especially women in these kinds of situations. And they want to learn. The machine will give you the words if we're in Germany, learning German or, or, or learning uh, Slovene, uh, the machine will enable them to learn the words, will empower them to say, whereas the mediator, the interpreter, will just give them the answers and not the language. Okay? So there are real advantages to using machine translation over using human mediators, unless it's really high risk, in which case most legal regimes require human I must add, it's also that many of these people are coming from countries where nobody, no public official is ever neutral. They just assume that a public official is corrupt, so they don't want to see interpreters there. Okay? Now that's made me think a lot about what we're doing. I don't want to go there too much, I want to finish. What's interesting for me is that when the translators and interpreters do enter there, do come into that situation, it's in cases of extreme risk or cases where some decision has to be made. And the person hearing it in court, for example, or the doctor, needs to be sure. When it's in the rough and tumble of dialogue and, and, and to and flow from in, in our encounters with doctors or with, with uh, um, uh, officials, okay, machine translation is good enough. Good enough, good enough to get by. But when it's really, really high risk, then you need the person there who is competent. Why? Because they say things better than the machine? No, it's because they will take on the role of the authority. They will, in fact, authorize it. So I see what's happening there and in many other situations where a client comes in and says, I've done a machine translation, please check it. Professional checks it, good. Three mistakes, corrected. Stamp. Authority. Like a notary for a legal document. Yes, it's a valid legal document. Yes, it's a valid translation. This authorizing function, this assumption of trustworthiness, I think is one of the areas in which the translation profession has to come into its own. We should stop seeing ourselves as 
conveying thousands of words, selling words. What we have to sell is our authority and trustworthiness. That involves working a lot on interpersonal relations, interpersonal communication. See, in that way, machine translation should actually create new work for us. In post-editing, which I mean is selling trustworthiness, okay? Pre-editing, the technical writing that enables machines to work well, like Caterpillar English and things like that. The kind of project management that large projects require when machines are integrated into it. Terminology, which is much needed, the glossaries that are in the databases of the machines, and the database management, keeping them clean, keeping them functional. Okay, I'll it's just more on the bottom one. Uh, interpreting the data, I mean, once you've got the text, you've got to say what it means. But the, the bottom one is very important. That when machine translation stops, when it goes something that's very close to the text, assumption of the same function, etc., and rewriting begins, that's where our profession should come into its own. We have to look at that category of translatorial action, as, as Christian Nord said, uh, that is not a direct translation of the source text. Public relations, marketing, cross-cultural consulting, these are the areas where I would like to see our training moving. Not just, it's not enough to learn about machine translation or translation technology. We have to learn to use that technology to do the things that we do better than any machine. Thank you very much for your attention.